hundreds of years, from Roman times until the beginning of the last century, the stones of Egypt were all we had seen and almost all we knew of this ancient civilization. And, except for what we could learn from great travelers like Herodotus, we knew nothing at all about the men who had built these amazing structures. Then, in 1798, Napoleon invaded Egypt. His reign there was brief, but he brought with his armies a group of scholars to study the land, and an artist named Vivant Dernon, who spent his time drawing the great temples and monuments and in copying the mysterious carvings that covered their surfaces. When they were published, these drawings fascinated all of Europe. same period, the science and art of archaeology was getting underway. And from then until now, there has scarcely ever been a time when an archaeological expedition wasn't digging somewhere in the sands or among the stones of Egypt, making marvelous discoveries, using more and more advanced techniques to uncover the history and culture of the ancient Egyptians. Hieroglyphs, a Greek word that means sacred carvings, were the greatest obstacle in the search for knowledge. There had been over the centuries many fanciful theories about how they might be read. But it was an Englishman named Young and a Frenchman named Champollion who solved the mystery. The problem was enormous. Here clearly was an eye. Did it only mean eye, or might it also mean sight and vision? And might those signs under it stand for numbers or sounds? This man with a staff, was he a shepherd? Or might this mean power or authority? Here was a man leaning on a staff. Did this mean weak or old or simply to lean upon? A pot with legs, could that mean to bring or to carry? Many hieroglyphs like these were fairly easily identifiable, but some, even as picture writing, were very puzzling. Champollion, studying engravings on the Rosetta Stone, guessed that these hieroglyphs, set in an oval, signified royalty. They are called cartouche. When he compared the cartouche for King Ptolemy with one he believed was for Cleopatra, he found that the P, L, and O fell where he expected them to, and so proved that certain hieroglyphs only represented sounds. His work, and the work of many other scholars, made it possible for us to read the ancient Egyptians' language. We learned that the early Egyptian did not write vowel sounds, and that he never had a true alphabet. But he did write our sound N, with this wavy line. And this horned serpent was F. And this leg, strangely enough, was our sound B. To form words, these phonograms were used by the rebus, or picture puzzle principle. As if in English, we would draw a B and a leaf to write the word belief. Some hieroglyphs were used to give a clue to the meaning of a word without being specific. These are called determinatives. For example, this man pointing to his head could mean eating, 
or thinking or speaking. But when he is placed in relation with these hieroglyphs, the whole combination means to drink. With the passage of time, the writing of the language was simplified, probably because the pen was substituted for the chisel. The owl, for example, eventually lost its bird-like quality altogether. Fully developed 3,000 years before Christ, the ancient Egyptian's language was highly complex and elegant. He called it the God's words, and he called his land the Black Land. The Black Land was not always hemmed in by deserts. Millions of years ago, the entire region was covered by forests, and there was abundant rainfall. But the rainfall diminished. The forests gave way to savannas, and finally to barren soil, to vast deserts of sand. With these changes, animals and men moved gradually to the Nile. From its two sources in the high regions of the African interior, the Nile flowed north, making its way across 4,000 miles of mountains, jungle, swamp, and desert to the Mediterranean. Then as now, the Nile rose in summer, overflowed its banks, and flooded the valleys it had cut for itself, leaving a rich black silt, and making of Egypt an oasis several hundred miles long. Here along this fertile strip, the ancestors of the ancient Egyptians settled. Stone Age men, full of superstition and magic, with the sun and moon and hawks and bulls and apes and cats for their gods. Slowly they learned to control their land, to work together in draining the marshes of the Nile and irrigating the valleys. To capture and to hold the rich waters meant constant, back-breaking work. But they did it and made for themselves a kind of paradise. They settled all the way from the Mediterranean to the highlands of Upper Egypt. They were all dependent upon the Nile, whose yearly rhythm of ebb and flood sustained them and permeated their thought. And after many hundreds of years, they were united. The crowns of two kings became one, and the long history of the ancient Egyptian properly began. The unremitting sun, the deserts which surrounded him like a fortress and made him feel secure, and the river Nile, these were the main factors in the life of the ancient Egyptian, especially the Nile. For along its banks, everything grew rich and green. From the beginning, the Egyptian himself seems to have loved life and the world around him. He was a materialistic man, industrious and practical. To him, what was useful was good. He became a skillful mathematician. He devised the first 365-day calendar. And in the antique world, he was famous as a medical man. His land was rich in gold and copper, and especially in building stone. And with this stone, although he did not have wheels or pulleys, he built structures that seemed to promise to stand into eternity. His society was organized rather like the pyramids he built with peasants and slaves at its base, above them scribes, officials, nobles, and at the apex, the king. But it was a remarkably flexible society, and there was great opportunity for any man to rise and to improve his lot. In his religion, 
there were many remnants of his Stone Age past. But it is wrong to think that the ancient Egyptian worshipped the animals and animal-headed beings that he carved and painted with such skill and beauty. He simply believed that from time to time, the gods might be pleased to inhabit these sacred beasts. The sun that came up so dependably each morning to shed its light and heat and seemed each evening to die. And the Pharaoh were, for the Egyptian, the most immediate and intimate of his gods. He believed that his king literally was a god, and he held this belief for many centuries. During what is called the Old Kingdom, which lasted from 2700 BC down to 2000 BC, the Pharaoh was all powerful, and the good of the kingdom and of all men depended upon him. Above all, the ancient Egyptian believed that he would live forever. His idea of death was quite different from ours, and no men in history have ever so spent themselves in preparation for it, in building tombs and in decorating them for eternity. For the Egyptian, to die was simply to follow the sun god's course, to travel across the sky, which was itself a goddess, to sink in the west, and to descend into the underworld. There, past many dangers, Osiris, king of the underworld, waited to judge the dead man, to weigh his heart against truth and rightness, whose hieroglyph was a feather. Thereafter, he was free to return to the world where he could be whatever he might like to be. Isolated in his lovely land, the Egyptian lived a busy, carefree life for 500 years. Earthly wealth and earthly success were what he most admired, and he achieved them, only to lose them. Around 2100 BC, his kingdom collapsed in civil wars. The Pharaoh, as god king, lost his absolute power and never afterwards regained it. The royal tombs were ransacked and robbed. And from this time on, royal burials were done in secret, in tombs hidden in the cliffs of the Nile Valley. Then, even the surrounding deserts proved to be no protection. An Asiatic people called the Hyksos invaded Egypt and conquered it with the horse and the war chariot, neither of which the Egyptians had ever seen. Once he had driven the Hyksos out, the Egyptian took the war chariot and the horse and set out to recover his proud position in the world.
He conquered the peoples of Nubia and the Sudan. And he fought his way eastward into Asia, as far as the valley of the Euphrates. By the 16th century BC, he had established a vast empire. Things changed radically. Yet the Egyptian's decorative art changed very little. As he had done from the beginning, he continued to carve and to paint in the same styles and in amazing detail the life he loved and believed he would enjoy forever. of the Egyptian's empire, the extent of his might and of his power in the ancient world, are reflected in his sculpture and in his temples of the period. They became colossal. He carved, even into the stone cliffs of the Nile Valley, 
gigantic figures of the Pharaoh and the gods. At Karnak, he built the greatest existing temple on earth. Yet in achieving all of this, and in ruling his empire, the Egyptian seems to have lost his love of life. His old initiative was replaced by rigid discipline. His gaiety gave way to gloom. Himself, though he might be splendid in his tomb, became in life a kind of puppet. His power and much of the wealth of Egypt passed into the hands of priests who kept the great temples. The Pharaoh's days were regulated by rules and rituals, so that at last an Assyrian king could refer to him and to Egypt as a broken reed. The Egyptian empire fell to a series of conquerors. First the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, and after them in 525 BC, the Persians. Then in 332 BC, the Greeks under Alexander, and finally the Romans. Under each of his conquerors, the Egyptian held tightly to his past and continued to worship his gods and to build temples. The long years of his grandeur were over. But in those years, he had made a vast contribution to civilization and to the culture of the world. High up the river Nile at Aswan, men and machines have built a great dam. The dam has made a huge lake under whose surface some of the ancient Egyptians art has already disappeared. A few temples have been saved by being dismantled and moved stone by stone to higher ground. And the greatest of these monuments is the temple at Abu Simbel. Carved into the face of a cliff in the 13th century BC, it was hidden for centuries under the sands of Egypt. Now, in the triumph of modern engineering, it has been moved intact and will tower for centuries more above the waters of the Nile.